Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Good, good placement on the mic? Okay. So good evening and welcome to Making Michigan, uh, the Bentley Library series on the history of the University of Michigan. I'm Gary Krenz, the director of the Judy and Stanley Frankel Detroit Observatory. Uh, for another eight days, at any rate. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome you to the observatory and to welcome our online audience on YouTube. Uh, this is my last Making Michigan, and as you know, I'm tonight's speaker, but I'm thrilled to announce that tonight is not the last Making Michigan. Andrew Rutledge and Austin Edmister will be carrying it forward, and the next session will be February 8th, featuring Joel Howell, uh, who will discuss the fascinating history of the University of Michigan Hospital, so stay tuned for an announcement. I'm not going to introduce myself. There was a bit of a bio, I think, in the, in the uh, email that went out, and the talk is certainly going to convey some things uh, about me. Uh, those of you who have been, have been to Making Michigan before know that typically the way this works is that there's a talk uh, and then there's a little sort of discussion interview session and then there's Q&A uh, and Andrew uh, has uh, graciously agreed to interview me uh, after my presentation to avoid the awkwardness of my interviewing myself. <laughs> Uh, Andrew, received, Andrew received his bachelor's degree from the University of California, Riverside, and his master's from the University of Chicago before completing his PhD in history at the University of Michigan. After a period at the William L. Clements Library, he joined the Bentley uh, in 2018 as a research as, uh, associate. Uh, since then, he's been doing really wonderful work on a number of ongoing historical projects, such as the African American Student Project and the history of the Detroit Observatory. Uh, check out our website for some of the wonderful white papers that Andrew has done on the history of the building uh, just upstairs. Uh, before starting, I want to say what a really great pleasure it has been to spend the last five years of my career at the Bentley and the Observatory working with a great group of people. I really can't imagine a better ending. And uh, a quick uh, happy birthday to my sister-in-law, Mary, sister Mary Jo, uh, who's online and who is, a rec is recently in remission, remission uh, much to our great uh, relief. So here we go. And I need to start with an apology. Those questions that went out in that promotional email, right, how Homer and Jeannie Neal got me into trouble with my mother, how I had my own bathroom in the Fleming administration building, are not going to be answered until the interview part of the session, okay? <laughs> this is my way of holding you hostage for the talk. Uh, but truly, you know, if you're online, you can obviously tune out uh, and come back in about 30 or 40 minutes, and I wouldn't be the wiser. For those of you here in the room, it's a little more problematic. I actually will notice if you get up and leave, <laughs> but I'm not going to ask you to explain yourself, so it's up, to, it's up to you. So I have to confess that about two days into preparing this talk, I thought, what in the world did I get myself into? How could I possibly talk in any meaningful way about my career at Michigan, not to mention about larger themes and topics bearing on U of M history over the past 35 years? and be at least moderately interesting. But I've persevered in the presentation. You're all going to have to suffer the consequences. But I do want to issue a caveat. There are so many issues, so many complexities, that I could have bogged down every part of this talk in qualifications, in allusions to counterexamples, in references to things or people not mentioned. Instead, I've just put my head down, plowed ahead. Uh, and I hope you believe me when I say I know things are more complex than I'm going to say they are. <laughs> Uh, and I hope you'll feel free to keep, make me, uh, keep me honest in the Q&A part, uh, part of the program. So, my in-service date at U of M was April 11th, 1988. And this uh, montage is actually the Michigan Daily front page from, every, uh, from April 8th, every five years since then. So this is a quick history, as April was just saying. Some of this is awfully relevant uh, for today. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in any case. Uh, so anyway, you, you see, 88 to today, that's 35 years. So you see I'm stretching things a bit when I say four decades at Michigan. On the other hand, this is actually the fifth decade in which I have been at Michigan. So that's the fact check, and you can decide if the title's appropriate or not. Oh. Now, in 1988, I was fresh out of grad school. No, sorry, wrong picture. 
Uh, although I have to say, uh, when I realized that this picture was, uh, from, from the time of this picture to the time I was hired, is shorter from the time I was hired to today, those are the kinds of things that make you think about retirement, right? So here's a picture that's a little more accurate. I'm actually working, just about finishing up my dissertation at that point. Anyway, as I was saying, in April 1988, I was fresh out of grad school and serving as an administrator in the physics department, working with Homer Neal. More on that in just a minute. And to provide a little bit of uh, background, you, you have a handout here. Sorry, those of you on YouTube, you don't have a handout. Uh, anyway, this is a very idiosyncratic timeline. I'm not going to cover every cell. Uh, I'm not going to come close to covering every cell on this sheet. Uh, but of course, I can take questions in the Q&A and try to provide uh, some answers on some of these things. But just a few quick comments. First, the structure of this, right? I mean, we have the years. We have the places that I worked in this column. We have the presidents of the university. We have a number of activities and events in this column over here, uh, most of which I was involved in in some way or another. We have some diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion milestones for good or for ill. Right? We have, uh, where are we here? Oh, some globalization milestones, just a few things. Uh, we have national championships, nat national athletics championships. Uh, and a couple of Heisman uh, awards thrown in. And then we have a kind of a grab bag of uh, world affairs uh, of different sorts in each of these years just to provide a little context. So just a few quick comments on my workplace. That's a pretty long stretch in the president's office, which is great. Terrible stretch in the Fleming building, which was a terrible building to work in, but uh, president's office, okay. And I remember one evening I got a, got a call uh, from a student uh, who was on a phone bank for my alma mater, Northwestern University, and they were updating alumni records and so forth. And uh, she asked me where I worked, and I said, in the president's office, and she said, of the United States? <laughs> and when I clarified, she was really audibly crestfallen. <laughs> so, so I guess I've fallen a little short of uh, some people's uh, expectations. Uh, the column on diversity. I just want to note that this the diversity has been a recurring theme in Making Michigan, right? Uh, if you, ha you have the handout that has the whole set of Making Michigan sessions, and I'd point to things like these sessions with Matthew Johnson, Bethany Hughes, Andrea Turpin, Stephen Ward, and many more. It's, it's clearly a recurring theme. Uh, similar, similarly, Making Michigan has covered the international in various ways, and not just in this period, but going back to Julie Eiffel's uh, talk on U of M and the Spanish Civil War, and more recently, Tim Johnson on U of M and Ghana, and uh, Fran Bluen on U of M and the Vatican uh, Project, which was just last month. Athletics. Really not going to address athletics tonight. But I would point to the two Making Michigans by Brian Williams and Greg Kinney, which are well worth uh, looking at. Uh, and I have to note, you know, there's been kind of a dearth since I left, left the president's office of national championships. So, you know, draw your, draw your own conclusions. Uh, maybe that'll change uh, next month, but we'll see. And the final column really is a grab bag. And honestly, some of the choices about what to put in that column really just came down to what can you say in a couple of words about some things. Uh, some things are just too complex to say anything in two words. Uh, but it was kind of sobering. Barb helped me put this together, did a lot of Wikipedia research. Uh, and it's kind of amazing how, uh, how your memory gets the order of things wrong over this kind of a time span. But I want to begin with a very particular episode. This one right here, right at the top in 1988. One of the first moments in my career came just a few months after my date of hire. Uh, at the end of September 1988, when the Rackham Graduate School celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Horace H. Rackham building, still to this day one of my favorite buildings on campus. And some of you will recall that Rackham uh, celebrated this moment with a two-day symposium, Intellectual History and Academic Culture at the University of Michigan, Fresh Explorations. Uh, this symposium featured a powerful lineup of faculty who have since become, you know, sort of ensconced in the path pantheon of U of M intellectual life. Uh, people like John Darms, who was the dean of Rackham at the time, uh, and just to name a few others, Fran Bluen, Sidney Fine, Phil Converse, Martha Vecinas, Rudolf Arnheim, Terry Sandelow, Rita Duma, Paul McCracken, Patricia Guren, I could go on. 
And my boss, Homer Neal, the brand new chair of the physics department, was to be a panelist responding from the standpoint of the physical sciences to the lead paper in one of the sessions. Uh, some of you may know where this is going. Uh, and I helped Homer uh, prepare, that, uh, prepare that paper. Now, the lead paper in that session, the keynote paper in that session, has become, I think it is fair to say, legendary in the annals of Michigan's intellectual history. And I think it has had an outsized impact on U of M's self-understanding. It was actually reissued by the Bentley in 2013, the 75th anniversary of Rackham, with an addendum by its author. On the occasion of its reissue, Fran Blue and the Bentley director noted that it was, quote, upon reflection, the most enduring contribution of the 1988 symposium. So for those of you who can remember 1988, who have simply been attuned to discourse about U of M over the years, the paper in question is, of course, David Hollinger's Academic Culture in Michigan at Michigan, 1938 to 1988, the apotheosis of pluralism. I was going to talk about apotheosis, but if we, you know, if we have time, we can get into that later. Or it is, as it has usually been identified over the years simply as the Hollinger paper. David Hollinger was on the history faculty at the time. He actually left U of M for Berkeley not long after the symposium, but his paper is still very much with us. Now, I'm not going to launch into a critique of Hollinger's paper. Uh, I do want to pick up some of his themes and think about how they've played out since 1988. Uh, Hollinger's paper was rigorous scholarship. My talk is not. He focused on academic culture, mostly in terms of uh, faculty work. My approach will be looser, but it's kind of a, uh, it's been kind of a nice organizing uh, approach for me to, to, the, uh, to, to try to fit these, these years of uh, time at Michigan into a sort of a coherent uh, presentation. So to begin with, I'd just like to say, you know, there is sort of a deep history of pluralism at the University of Michigan. Our first president, Henry Tappan, articulated an innovative vision for an institution that was intellectually pluralistic. Uh, some of you might have heard me talk about this before. Tappan thought that U of M should be what he called a true university, covering the full range of human inquiry and practice. And that notion of academic breadth back in the 1850s was quite revolutionary. Uh, and we'll come back to that, uh, that idea later in the, in the talk. Tappan also had a view of uh, the university as a demographically pluralistic institution within limits. He was adamantly opposed to coeducation, thinking that it would produce monstrosities. So under him, U of M remained very much a male institution. When James Angel became president, U of M had just admitted women, uh, women students. And Angel turned out to be just the person to champion this move and to aggressively advance the idea that the university should be open to all, as he famously said in a commencement address in 1879, an address I would even today recommend as a wonderful exposition, <coughs> pardon me, exposition of the value of pluralism and the democratizing function of a university. Excuse me. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. Uh, okay. Uh, Angel also championed academic freedom, a, a subject we'll, ta uh, we'll touch on a little bit today. So Hollinger was not operating in a vacuum when he took up this topic. And here, good, okay, here is Hollinger's argument. He argued that U of M is, is more pluralistic than its peers in 1988, more egalitarian than its peers in 1988, persistently generic, and we can get into what that means if there's time, excellent from breadth, not specialization. And he contrasts Michigan with Stanford, which built spires of excellence and kind of ignored a lot of the other stuff, right? Michigan was rigorously academically professional, not publicly intellectual, as, opposed, as compared to Columbia, is his other example, where faculty were constantly appearing 
uh, in the New York Review of Books, the Atlantic, and so forth. Uh, he noted that there had been a shift in emphasis at U of M away from the natural sciences and humanities and toward the social sciences during this period of the Rackham uh, building. And of course, he talked a lot about how U of M was a contested site during the McCarthy era with the Davis, Markert, and Nickerson case. And in fact, Hollinger's paper was one of the reasons that attention was again directed to this episode of a violation of academic freedom uh, in, uh, in Michigan's uh, past. Okay. So before I go, so this is the philosophy, you know, the philosopher in me coming out, right? Before I uh, get into this, I want to provide a little bit of a theoretical framework. This is something that I developed uh, when I was teaching a class on, called U of M, a moral institution, uh, which was about ethics and higher education. And there are, two, there are two schemes in this framework. The first is a structural scheme, right? So this is the structure of the university. Every university is a multiversity, as, uh, as Clark Kerr famously said. But I contend that the university can be analyzed in terms of interactions and transactions between four different organs. Right? At the center is the collegium. Right? That's the academic activity, the faculty, the students, as students, all those things that go into the academic work of the institution. It's at the center because without that, we're not a university, we're something else. Right? But it's also a corporation. Here, officially, we are the corporation of the Board of Regents of the University of Michigan. Right? And along with that go all the administrative functions and so forth. We are a community. Uh, this is all of the life of faculty, students, alumni, staff, and others. All those things that are not part of the collegial, the collegium activity. So the student organizations, the football team, all of those sorts of things. Uh, the dorms, all of those things that are not strictly academic, but that form the larger community of the university. And we are a commonwealth, or we are at least connected to the commonwealth, the larger society. We hold a public trust. That's true of private institutions too, but especially a public institution holds a public trust for the commonwealth in which it is sort of instantiated. And university history in a lot of ways is interactions and shifts among these different sorts of players. Now there's also a normative scheme, right? The university has purposes and ends. What is our purpose? What are we here for? The university has norms of access. This mostly has to do with the collegium. Who gets to be a faculty member? Who gets to be a student? Uh, how can they afford to be a student at University of Michigan and so forth? Right? Uh, it is norms of efficacy. Where are the powers, the authorities, the persuasions, the coercions that actually help get things done? And finally, we have constitutional norms. Those are these norms that make us uh, able to uh, fulfill our ends, to meet the ends that we have. And certainly, or almost certainly, academic freedom is the primary constitutional norm. Without academic freedom, no genuine academic in inquiry, right? No genuine academic education. So I'll allude to this framework as the talk, uh, as the talk goes on, and hopefully it will be useful uh, to you, as I hope it was to students in my class, too. So. <laughs> Okay, so these are the themes I'm gonna to quickly touch on. Rebuilding the sciences, technology revolution, soul of undergraduate education, privatization, globalization, and access to Michigan. These are things that I think, uh, we're gonna talk about what happened with these themes uh, over the past uh, 35, uh, 35 years or so. So, rebuilding the sciences. Uh, Remember, this is the statement from, from Hollinger. There was this shift toward the national sciences. The National Research Council uh, used to do decanal uh, surveys of graduate programs, rankings of graduate programs uh, in, uh, in American universities. They still do, they still do this, but you, you can't really call them rankings anymore. Uh, and uh, in the 1980s, university administrators, faculty to some extent, but especially university administrators, waited with bated breath to see what the NRC was gonna say about where your institution ranked in you know, 80 different disciplines, something like that. And so in uh, the mid-1980 rankings, uh, they came out and lo and behold, there was a shock 
to the U of M system because the natural science departments had fallen dramatically from the rankings a decade before. Physics fell from a top 10 department to barely in the top 20. Biology, chemistry, geology also had significant uh, loss of status. And what this did, what this did was to mobilize a massive effort to rebuild the sciences at U of M. This was under the auspices of Jim Duderstadt, who was provost at the time. Uh, and this is how I came to be employed at U of M, uh, even though I knew nothing about the sciences, knew nothing about re how to rebuild sciences, and employed in a way that let, uh, led to lots of opportunities I likely would not otherwise have had. So what Jim did was to recruit Homer Neal, recently provost at St uh, Stony Brook University, to come back to his alma mater and chair the physics department with funding and a mandate. Now, I first met Homer uh, in a stairwell in the administration building at Stony Brook where I was working on my PhD. I was walking down the stairs uh, after an interview for an internship in the provost's office, and Homer came bounding up the stairs, I think three at a time. Uh, I think he was a little surprised to see anybody else in the stairwell, but he stopped just ever so briefly and said, hello, how are you doing? And then headed on up. Uh, I had no idea, of course, that I would spend nine years uh, working for him at a, at a pivotal point in my early, uh, early career. Uh, so I got the internship and worked not for Homer, but for an assistant, uh, assistant provost, and then actually for his successor as provost, Jerry uh, Schubel, and finished my PhD. And Barbara and I went out to dinner at our favorite Chinese restaurant uh, to, uh, to celebrate. And Homer and Jeannie Neal were there. And it turned out they were heading back to Michigan, as were Barb and I at that point. And Homer said to look him up if I was having trouble finding work, which I was. This was a terrible time for philosophy PhDs. And I did. And the rest is history. Uh, so uh, I was part of this effort in physics to rebuild uh, the department. And it resulted in uh, a new building, a new laboratory building, which is now officially the Homer A. Neal uh, Laboratory Building. Uh, there was a uh, significant increase in the size of the faculty, mostly in uh, condensed matter physics and astrophysics to complement uh, the ongoing strength the department had in high energy physics. Uh, we launched a distinguished lecture series, which parts of which eventually morphed into the very popular now uh, Saturday morning physics. Uh, one of the distinguished speakers was Ernest Courant. I actually met Paul's father, Paul Courant's father, before I met Paul. Uh, and there were great people there to work with. Uh, you know, Myron Campbell, Stirad Uher, Jens Zorn, Ada Newton, Roberta Merlin, uh, Brad Orr, Greg Tarley, and many more. You're not supposed to name individuals and to talk like this lest you leave somebody out, and I know I'm going to violate that rule. And I know tonight I will remember people that I really wanted to have mentioned, so I apologize in advance uh, to, those, uh, to those individuals. So as, um, as the physics rebuilding was achieving milestones, U of M's VP for research position opened, and Jim Duderstadt asked Homer to fill it. And I was fortunate enough to get to go along with Homer to OVBR and begin to work with an absolutely stellar group of people there. Marvin Parnes, Julie Ellison, Judy Nowak, Connie Bridges, Fred Neidhart, Sandy Whitesell, who oversaw the restoration of the observatory upstairs, uh, Jane Ritter, uh, Bob Samors, right? Great, great group of people. And what ensued was one of the most intense periods of my career at Michigan. In fact, when I look back on it, it's really hard for me to believe that it was under three years duration. Uh, it was a tremendously packed, uh, packed time, uh, just with so much going on. And a large part of that intensity had to do with engagement with national issues of national uh, research policy, science policy, and so forth. The Gingrich Congress, had come in after the uh, 1994 midterm elections, and they brought that, this Congress brought to uh, D.C. a new level, really new level of anti-government, anti-spending, anti-research uh, sentiment, posturing, and road blocking. Some things come around again and again. Uh, so there was a real need to try to rearticulate the rationale for national investment in research, in essence, to reaffirm this connection between the Commonwealth and the Collegium, 
right, and the value of the knowledge pursuing ends of the university. Now, Homer was a national, a national figure in, in science policy, a former member of the National Research Council, pioneer of federal support for undergraduate research, uh, a member of the board of the Smithsonian, and he made the most of this, and these events were a series of activities that involved U of M. And this is a different kind of intele public intellectualism, I think, from what David Hollinger was talking about, you know, playing out not in the pages of the New York Review of Books, but in the corridors of Washington, D.C., and on stages of public controversy. And there is also something of a Michigan tradition here. I think of people like Michael Oxenberg and Ken Lieberthal, who played such central roles in U.S. policy with respect to China. Uh, Ned Gramlich in his service on the Federal Reserve Board and in national policy on work on Social Security. Rebecca Blank and her work in the Obama and uh, Clinton and Obama administrations. And Jim Duderstadt also, who had a very long uh, stretch uh, of, engage of engagement with national research policy. I'm not going to talk about all of these things. I'm going to happy to answer questions, but I do want to talk about uh, the second thing on the list, the, uh, the, Enola, Gay, uh, the Enola Gay Symposium, uh, because of how it speaks to some shifts in our understanding uh, of pluralism. Now, this was officially titled Presenting History, Museums in a Democratic Society, and we did this in partnership with the Smithsonian. Now, you probably recall that the Enola Gay was the uh, plane that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, right? Uh, and you might remember that in the mid-1990s, the Smithsonian Institution, which held the plane in its collection, planned to mount an exposition for the 50th anniversary of the bombing. The initial plan included in addition to things that you might normally think of uh, for a, an institution like the Smithsonian, uh, but also included highlighting the Japanese victims of the, of the explosion uh, and giving visitors plenty of opportunities to reflect on whether the bomb was justified. I'm really simplifying here, obviously. And if you're interested in the topic, there was a lot written, written about it uh, subsequently. Well, there was, needless to say, an uproar, right? Uh, and U of M offered to work with the Smithsonian to mount a symposium to examine the issues in the midst of, of all of this going on. Uh, the, 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 the exhibit hadn't even been mounted yet, right? Uh, and it was not actually an easy undertaking. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of blowback, a lot of stress. Uh, even mounting this was, many people uh, saw this as very undesirable. But we did pull it off. I think it was successful. Uh, although, frankly, the thing I remember most about it is that right in the middle, the Oklahoma City bombing happened. And so this whole symposium uh, where we're talking about a bombing, where we're talking about all of this hurt and harm, had this added layer uh, that just really cast, uh, cast a pall. I think, I think we recorded it. And I imagine the Bentley has the recordings, and one of the things I'd love to do in, in uh, retirement is take a look, okay? So that was national research policy. Uh, after Homer uh, and uh, uh, Lee Bollinger came in, and Lee Bollinger continued this effort uh, by appointing a commission to examine life sciences at the university, which ultimately led to the creation of the Life Sciences uh, Institute. Uh, you know, as a reminder, this was the period in which the mapping of the human genome under U of M's own Francis Collins was taking place. Uh, and I also want to note that LSI, for reasons we can get into later, got off to a very rocky start. And it was really saved by the steady guidance of Mary Sue Coleman and the skill of Liz Berry, whom interim President Joe White, uh, whom, uh, interim President Joe White had presciently appointed managing uh, director after Lee left uh, U of M. Uh, and so it's entirely appropriate, of course, that this is now uh, Mary Sue Coleman Hall, which uh, houses the Life Sciences Institute. So all of these efforts in the sciences could be seen as reversing the shift in emphasis that Hollinger had talked about and in rebuilding this sort of broad excellence that, uh, that U of M had. Uh, they could also be seen as a positive synergy between the corporation and the collegium, right, with the corporation kind of marshalling resources for the collegium to do new things. 
uh, the information revolution, right? This is the second topic. I think it's important to talk about it. Uh, it's in so many ways shaped the world since 1988 in ways that none of us really could have predicted. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but it clearly has changed every aspect of the university for good and for ill. Uh, we struggle with how to deal with ongoing change, and now with AI there are very real questions about what shape academic work can and will take going forward. Uh, information technology has leveled the knowledge environment, right? Uh, sometimes almost to non-existence, but it's leveled the knowledge environment. Some of you might recall that about 20 years ago, Tom Friedman wrote a book called The World is Flat, right? Which discussed, among other things, the way in which IT uh, was changing geopolitics, economics, and more, uh, empowering individuals versus collective uh, actors. And the analysis applied in many ways to higher education. And in fact, uh, the executive officers organized a reading of Friedman's book. Uh, Friedman came in, uh, met with the team, uh, gave a public talk, uh, and uh, you know, at least some new understandings, I think, came out of it. Uh, one of the things about the information revolution, I think, is that uh, you know, this is what made possible the very idea of a universal library, which was one of our sessions uh, last spring uh, on U of M uh, and Google. And I'd just like to reiterate a point uh, about that, and that's the important role that Paul Courant played in that, the really visionary role that Paul Courant played, uh, and the stellar leadership that Mary Sue uh, Coleman provided on that matter. Uh, third point, the soul of undergraduate education. So the information revolution uh, has certainly had a large impact on undergraduate ed. Uh, as faculty and the institution have worked to adapt to everything from students using laptops in the classroom, what a quaint you know, challenge that appears now, uh, to internet facilitated plagiarism, to now you know, chat GPT, uh, and of course, not just challenges, but opportunities, exponential increase in access to information, uh, to the collected works of humankind, ever more sophisticated simulations, new approaches to authoring, uh, the list could go on and on. And uh, you know, I have to say that for the most part, I think the integration has been kind of impressively effective. Still, what to do about undergraduate ed, especially the first two years of general education, has been an ongoing question. From the late 1980s uh, to the mid or late 1990s, there were basically a series of presidential and provostial commissions devoted to the topic. And for a while, it was a running joke with some of us in the Fleming Building that each successive commission had to find a new way to say the same thing. Uh, but that said, each commission did improve, it did produce some, some important results. Uh, one of the things that the technology environment helped us uh, help do was to shift users, as it were, from more passive forms of engagement, right, like si sitting in front of a television, to more active forms, like playing a video game. And undergraduate ed needed to follow uh, suit in some ways. And undergraduate research, which Homer Neal had a particular interest in, grew significantly over this period as one response. Uh, there were other shifts uh, going on. Uh, some of them accelerated by the topic we're going to get to in a minute, privatization. Uh, and this is, a, you know, one of these is a shift in the dominant ends of undergraduate students. The last 40 years has seen an increase in pre-professionalism uh, at the undergraduate level. And I want to just show quickly a graph, right? So this is just four degrees. These are, this, these are degrees, BA degrees granted by major. Uh, look at this line. This is English degrees. This is English degrees over this period. This is business degrees over this period. Right? Uh, this is a new shape to the university. This is a new understanding of university ends that presents uh, a kind of, uh, kind of challenge. And along with this has been the emergence of professional schools at the bachelor's level. Right? Pre-admission to the MBA program, BBA program, which predates this period, but uh, BBA program. Uh, undergraduate uh, programs in information, in the School of Public Policy, and so forth. So, so very much a shift in what students are after. So this is a shift in ends. Uh, this isn't necessarily anything new. I think there's always been, for 300 years anyway, a kind of ebb and flow between emphasis on professionalism and emphasis on liberal education. 
uh, and another Making Michigan Call Out. This is to Terry McDonald's talk on the truth about the liberal arts, which, I, again, I recommend. Uh, one of the unfortunate or maybe ironic things is uh, the perceived value of education has declined in this same period. So there's a kind of a mismatch going on here uh, that we're going to have to figure out how to, uh, or are trying to figure out how to deal with. Next topic, privatization. Okay. Uh, some of you have probably seen this graph before, right? The blue line is uh, the percentage of the general fund budget that is derived from tuition and fees. The red line is state funding, right? They cross right around 1990, just after 1988. What this really signals is uh, really a massive shift of the university from being a public good to being a private good, uh, from a taxpayer burden to a tuition payer burden. And I think that this has had a lot of implications. Uh, I think that one thing is uh, an increasingly consumerist view among students about what they are going to college for or what college is about. Uh, and that's partly reflected in that shift in the field of study that we just saw, right? I mean, people are looking for a return on investment. Whether the BBA gives them that return is another question, but they're looking for a return on investment. It also fosters a sort of corporatization of the university with the pressure on institutions to support themselves through self-generated funds, development, marketing, branding, and all, of, all that goes with them. All of that's become a lot more prominent over this period. And this changes the balance between the collegium and the corporation. And, you know, athletics is part of this. Uh, there, was a lot of, there were a lot of drivers pushing colleges toward the enlargement of re revenue-generating sports like football, basketball, and at least in U of M's case, uh, ice hockey. Uh, and U of M, under Don Canham as athletic director, was actually a leader, a, a, a pioneer in this regard. But now we have, at least in my uh, opinion, right, uh, a, a situation that's often out of, out of control with athletics becoming the tail uh, wagging the dog. And this is just, oops, sorry, this is just one small indication of that. Uh, about 15 years ago, there was a shift in U of M branding. Some of you will remember that the U of M seal used to be much more prevalent on campus, on letterheads, on the blue building signs, on sweatshirts and t-shirts. Today, the seal is largely a relic on campus, relegated to diplomas and the official communications of the Board of Regents, and, well, my, my lapel pin, but, <laughs> uh, you know, the block M dominates, and the block M was an athletic symbol. The block M was invented by the athletic department. Uh, this is a shift that I actually argued to some against, uh, to, against at the time to some extent, but there's really no arguing uh, with the zeitgeist. Uh, still, I think we have to ask uh, whether or not the commercial discourse of the corporation has any uh, unintended detrimental effects on the academic discourse within the collegium, and I tend to think uh, I tend to think that there are some. Uh, okay, globalization. Uh, this is maybe a more positive note, uh, and I think this is actually kind of a new trend since uh, 1988. The, the more global nature of U of M. Uh, we recently had two Making Michigans, as I mentioned, uh, Tim Johnson and Fran Bluen, uh, talking about this. Uh, last year, we had a great presentation by Deirdre de la Cruz on the Reconnect, Recollect project to engage with the U of M collections that had been expropriated from the Philippines during the U.S. colonial uh, oppression in that country. All of that gives kind of a different twist to the idea of pluralism. Uh, again, this is an idiosyncratic uh, list and just a drop in the bucket, but I think it does demonstrate a strategic engagement with the international at the presidential level that had not been true in the Hollinger era and maybe not any time since, uh, since Angel. And much of this was, of course, due to Mary Sue Coleman's enthusiastic embrace and thoughtful leadership, and I was really privileged uh, to, be, uh, to be a part of it. Among other things... Barbara and I got to eat duck feet for the first time uh, with a representative from the Chinese Administ Ministry of Education. And one of the things that struck us in our naive naivete or, or chauvinism, perhaps, 
uh, was that our hosts were really concerned that we were not going to like the duck hearts, uh, but gave no thought whatsoever that we might not like the duck feet. Um, you know, I'd say we loved the former and thought the latter were not nearly as bad as we were afraid they were going to be. So anyway, uh, not to trivialize it, but, uh, but in any case, I also want to point out I've included in here uh, the residencies of the RSC, and I want to acknowledge Ralph Williams, who was so central in all of this, uh, the relationship with the RFC. If we had more time, I'd say more about that, and maybe we can do that uh, later. I want to reiterate a couple of points that Tim Johnson made in his talk. Uh, one is that I do believe that U of M has been animated in its engagement by the spirit of genuine co-equal partnership and lasting commitment. And from all of what I could discover in my time working on these things, that is not by any means a widespread approach among universities engaging uh, internationally. Uh, it was certainly a value that guided everyone working on the initiatives I was involved with. The second point that Tim made, and I thought this was very interesting, is that globalization is not about geography. It's about a mindset. Right? The collegium makes us, in a way, citizens of the world, uh, a worldwide, of worldwide communities of inquiry, and so we can be citizens of the world wherever we are and in all of our experiences. And I thought it was, it was just delightful that Tim, Tim made that point. I think that the central uh, commitment to the international has waned a bit over the past decade. That's not a criticism. A lot of this stuff is still going very strong. Uh, and strategic priorities of the institution can't go on forever. They need to make room for new priorities. Uh, I do hope, though, that with the state the world is in, that uh, U of M can find maybe some new ways to engage uh, abroad strategically. Okay, finally, access, joining the collegium and the community. And we're gonna spend just a little more time on this. Uh, so, let's talk first about students. The decades since 1988 have really been one ongoing struggle for the diversity of the student population. And the record is mixed. Uh, as I'm sure you all well know, despite real efforts by the institution. The Making Michigan by Matthew Johnson a couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, looks at how that record is mixed with respect to racial justice. We could point also to Sarah Fitzgerald's talk from a while back on women's quest for equality uh, and equity, not just for students in that case, but faculty and staff. We've also seen in this period, I'll, I'll highlight this, some of this in just a minute, uh, a shift in the institution toward economic elitism. On the faculty side, I think there's no question that the faculty is much more diverse uh, today in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, many other measures than it was in 1988. But the rise of contingent faculty, basically uh, you know, non-tenure track uh, teaching and research faculty as a proportion of the whole con con uh, continues to present real challenges and raise questions about the nature, for instance, of academic freedom uh, today. <clears throat> so, diversity. Again, I'm not going to talk about uh, these in particular, but this is just a grab bag of some of the things that have happened with respect uh, specifically, uh, not, well, not specifically, no, I forgot what the list said, but some real, some real highlights here. Uh, and a lot of demonstration of uh, Michigan as a leading institution, even when uh, failure is just around, uh, uh, just around the corner. Economic elitism. Right? This is 2017 information, but I expect, I expect it hasn't changed much. This is the median family, and this was the median family income for stu undergraduate students at the University of Michigan, by far the highest of any public university in the country. Similarly, to do with how many families are in the top 10 percent, top whatever, uh, really, uh, really, really a very elite institution in many ways. Right. And just to compare us to the institution that in some respects is maybe our quintessential uh, peer, Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley, uh, you may know, maybe you don't. Berkeley was actually modeled after U of M when it was founded in the 1890s. It was very much inspired uh, by the U of M uh, of that time. And we see that they've resisted this kind of pressure a bit better uh, than we have, although they have distinct uh, sort of systematic advantages in that regard, which again, I'd be happy to talk about. Now, I have to say as an instructor, uh, you know, uh, 
I've watched this play out, right? When I first started teaching, or let's say 15 years ago, 15 uh, to 20 years ago, there was a very noticeable range in my classes in the degree to which students were prepared for college education. By the time I taught my last class in 2018, that range had all but disappeared, right? And these, I mean, these students were all incredibly well prepared. They're incredibly capable. They are really a joy to teach because they already know so much. They already have so many well-honed skills. It's just fantastic. But they are also quite homogenous in certain ways uh, because of this level of preparation. And I think that this does raise questions about our ends as a public university. Uh, and in what ways we are still performing the democratizing function that Angel thought was so important. Now, it's not like the university, the administration doesn't know this is an issue. Uh, and things like the Go Blue Guarantee have been implemented to try to address this. Here's another thing. This is the increase in enrollment by uh, community college transfers uh, over, what, 2008 to 2022. So this is, this is in some ways, a, a proxy for economic diversity, right? Uh, and that's clearly a positive trend. So we, we can hope that things like that uh, uh, gain, uh, gain traction going forward. Uh, contingent faculty, this is a breakdown. This is the most recent composition of U of M, right? So regular faculty, essentially talking about uh, tenure, tenure track and tenure. And contingent faculty who, uh, uh, you know, grad students and lecturers uh, make up a substantial portion of the instructional faculty, proportion far, far greater than in 1988. Uh, and these are instructors who are not as secure within the collegium as traditional faculty. Uh, it's a much more contractual relationship. I'm really simplifying. And I would note that this is a si this is simple head count and FTE count. If we were to look at credit hours, I was trying to track that down, but credit hours taught by regular faculty versus contingent faculty, I think the proportion of uh, contingent uh, faculty would be much larger than it appears in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, uh, chart. So why is this important? Uh, well, please remember, you know, we have this constitutional norm of, uh, of academic freedom. Uh, and since the late 1800s, American higher education has had a more and more robust understanding of academic freedom. There have clearly been setbacks, but at least the understanding of academic freedom has developed. Uh, and uh, John Dewey, uh, who spent time at U of M, was central to the, develop to, to the sort of the development of the American doctrine of academic freedom. Uh, but contingent faculty are much more dependent on the corporation than our regular faculty and uh, that they form such a large portion of instruction uh, raises big questions about academic freedom, their academic freedom, and by extension, the sort of education their students can be, uh, expect. And we have certainly seen incidents here in which contingent faculty have suffered. Uh, we see this all over the country, right? It's a, uh, it's a very different situation than it was uh, in 1988. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about academic freedom. Uh, Day, uh, Hollinger was talking about the Davis Marker Nickerson case when he said Michigan's pluralism was thus narrowed by its professionalism. And essentially what he meant by that was the professional community of academics, the prof professoriate, uh, had certain interests in the community of the professoriate, and those were determined to outweigh in that case the individual rights of, fa of, the, of the individual faculty. That's a very oversimplified version of what Hollinger was saying in his paper. Uh, but I think it's, it's more or less, you know, on, on, at least on point in some, to some extent. If you want an alternative view, look at the Making Michigan on uh, uh, Chandler Davis that took place uh, a few months ago with Alan Wald, Steve Batterson, and Peggy Hollingsworth. Uh, but today, you know, there are other challenges that in some ways come more from the community uh, of the university, although not so much at Michigan, maybe, but lots of other institutions are, are, are seeing real threats to academic freedom from sort of the commonwealth and the corporation. We live in an age where the protection of the interests and perspectives and safety of diverse members of the community must be negotiated 
with the freedom necessary to conduct unfettered uh, inquiry. Our students, often to their great credit, are protective of the position of people, even unlike themselves. This is a great accomplishment of empathy and a value to be cherished, but it's also a value that can, at times, be in tension with the radical uh, freedom of, uh, of inquiry. And this is something that I think is going to have to be rethought uh, in the age uh, that we're in and is a different form than what uh, Hollinger was talking about in 1988. Okay, so what's the legacy? Uh, I want to say just to just mention something about the term legacy. Uh, I think we'll be talking more in the interview portion of the program about the last 10 years of my career, the bicentennial uh, and the Bentley. You know, legacy has two meanings. Uh, one is it's something transmitted from ancestors or predecessors. And two, it's a kind of a bequest or a gift in a will, right? And it's very important for institutions, uh, especially universities, to reflect, reflect critically and with eyes fully open on their, uh, on their histories. That's something we certainly tried to do in the Bicentennial, it's something we've tried to do here with Making Michigan and here at the Observatory. Our legacy includes the good and the bad and the indeterminate, and the ability to reflect on it fully is something we really should celebrate, and none of that would be possible without the Bentley Library. Right? So where does this leave us? Well, here's a kind of a summary, right? I was tempted to give grades on each, but I think grades are kind of an abomination, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna do that. Uh, what's the upshot? Well, we live in a contentious age, the likes of which we have not seen for some time. Uh, we've seen a lot on this campus just in the last few weeks, ranging from legitimate and aggressive protests, right, to actions that are, in a way, assaults on our collegium and our community. Most of that, of course, uh, most of all of that has, of course, have been around the conflict uh, in Israel and Gaza. Uh, and universities should be testing grounds where these difficult issues get worked through, but none of this is taken for granted. Uh, you know, it'd be great if we could uh, always, as uh, Plato says in uh, The Republic, give our youth winged, winged horses right, so that they can engage in conflict but have a means of escape uh, to safety. So I want to leave you with just uh, this thought before we get into the discussion. Uh, this is from the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. The justification for a university is that it preserves the connection between knowledge and the zest of life by uniting the young and the old in the imaginative consideration of learning. And he goes on to say, the university imparts knowledge but it imparts it imaginatively. At least this is the function it should perform for society. A university that fails in this respect, uh, sorry, a university that fails in this respect has no reason for existence. This atmosphere of excitement arising from imaginative consideration transforms knowledge. A fact is no longer a bare fact. It is invested with all its possibilities. It is no longer a burden on the memory. It is energizing as the poet of our dreams and as the architect of our purposes. So a lot, not all, but a lot of what we see around us stems from youth's zest of life. And my parting hope for the University of Michigan is that we will always find ways to unite it with imaginative knowledge. So thank you very much. And We'll have, some, we'll have some discussion. Well, that was really a fantastic talk, Gary, and you covered a lot of ground and really gave us a lot of things to do. And I'm, I'm certainly going to go home and probably stay up in the small hours of the morning <laughs> trying to sleep thinking about it. Um, but you convinced all of these people to, and more importantly, convinced me to come here this evening with promises to answer four <laughs> questions. Yes, I just, so right. you've talked right. about how Homer Neal helped bring you to Michigan, but how did he get you in trouble with your mother? <laughs> well, uh, so again, I, I, I knew Homer, Barb and I knew Homer and Jeannie a little bit at, uh, at Stony Brook. Uh, Brian, uh, our oldest son, met them at Stony Brook. You don't remember that, I don't think. But, <laughs> but there came a time when um, we, we, we were, we as a family, were on our uh, vacation up north. And uh, uh, the kids were, I don't know, pretty young, pretty young, in, in, their, in, their, in single digits. And uh, Homer had contacted me and said he and Jeannie were going to be at the biology station, the biological station. 
and would we like to go to join them for this tour that he was be, he had just been named interim interim president right uh, and so we went we, we drove over uh, and uh, and met them and uh, and Jeannie uh, you know Jeannie was there and Brian and Chris sort of ran toward Jeannie and she scooped them up and said oh my babies my babies right uh, so what happened was uh, Barb <laughs> told my mother about this story, and it really did not go down well. I mean, she, she did not want any, uh, any substitute for herself as the grandmother of my kids. So it, took her, it actually took her a little while to come down off of that, but that's how, that's how, that's how they got me in trouble. <laughs> so. Well, Homer Neal was the first of four presidents you served under, and second was Lee Bollinger. Um, so what did you do that caused him to never want you to write anything for him again? Well, so the, the short answer is I don't know what I did. But, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you know, Lee, Lee, was, Lee, was, um, Lee, did all, Lee did virtually all of his own writing. I mean, Lee did not have a writer. Uh, and a lot of the stuff he did was extemporaneous. I mean, it was just he was really remarkable on the, on the stump. Uh, I remember uh, at Dan Little's uh, inauguration as chancellor of the University of Michigan Dearborn. The uh, the music there was a, there was a a, a, cha a a little chamber group that played this wonderful wonderful rendition of the Nimrod piece from Elgar's um, Enigma Variations. Just you know, if you know it, it's a very moving uh, piece of music. And Lee, Lee was about to speak next, and he just got up, and, and he gave sort of a, like a four-minute, just beautiful exposition of the meaning of that piece and the, uh, why it had the effect that it had and what it meant on an occasion like this. So this was Lee, right? This, you could just do this stuff. Well, there was an occasion in which I was supposed to write something for him, and I wish I could remember what it was. Uh, but it was going to be—it was remarks of some sort. Uh, he, he just needed—he couldn't do it by himself. So he couldn't do it on. A, he didn't have time. So I wrote it, and he called me into his office, and he said, "You know, I've had people write things for me in the past, but this is the first time I'm never going to change a word." And I said, "Oh, wow, that's <laughs> thank you. I'm going to thank you for telling me." And then he never asked me to write anything. <laughs> 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 Once you've reached perfection, why? <laughs> yeah, I suppose, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm sure it could have only been downhill for me from there, right? So. Um, but similarly speaking, you worked with Joe White after Lee Bollinger. And how did your gut yeah. not satisfy? What does that mean? Well, Joe, Joe was a, Joe, first of all, is a marvelous person. I mean, Joe is the consummate sort of compassionate professional. Well, I mean, I could say more about that, too. But, uh, but and again, I don't remember what the issue was. Um, but I had presented some things to him, and then there was going to be more work done. And he came into my office, and he said so. And I said some things, and he said, "Well, what does your gut tell you?" And, and I, I look, I, mean, I just don't operate that way. I, I, my my gut doesn't ever tell me anything except maybe, except maybe I'm hungry. You know, I mean, I have to. I have to have things marinate and germinate, and then something finally pops out, right? But uh, so I said, I don't know, and I think Joe was a little, uh, a little nonplussed. <laughs> but, but we we had a great relationship. I mean, he was he was a great he was a great guy to work for. Well, you also must have had a really great relationship with someone because you ended up with your own bathroom yeah, in well, the building. Yeah, yeah I, I had not much to do with it actually. No, no. What that 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 was that. I mean, it makes kind of an interesting point. Um, so Mary Sue came in, and uh, you know the, the 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 composition of the central administration started to change. There were more women executive officers. There were more women on staff. Uh, there were more women in the president's office. Well, that's not entirely true. I mean, there were always a lot of women in the president's office in my time. Uh, but it just turned out that for a certain period, I was the only man on the second floor of the Fleming administration <laughs> building. So I had the men's restroom entirely to myself. <laughs> well, those four questions really point to the fact that you, know, you served under four presidents, to, um, and each operated under different circumstances, had different personalities, but they were really the center of university leadership, needless to say. And I'm just curious, sort of in your experiences at Michigan, 
How did the nature of the university presidency change over the last four decades? And building off that, can I ask who was your favorite to work with? You, you, you can ask. <laughs> uh, so how is the, you know, there are lots of things you could say about that. I would say, first of all, uh, that um, fundraising has just become more and more and more a part of the president's job. Uh, public relations has become more and more a part of the president's job. Kind of, you know, I mean, these, these shifting, again, going back to that model, these shifting uh, relationships among these different parts of the university uh, take a kind of negotiation and articulation of values. And I think that that has become more and more uh, an issue. And of course, a lot of it, you know, this is driven by external externalities, right? I mean, uh, the way the communications environment has changed has simply changed the way pressure operates on the president, I think. So that's, that's one thing I would say. Um, you know, as far as who's the favorite, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give a favorite, uh, but I will say that they, they really all had, uh, had their own unique uh, and kind of remarkable uh, characteristics. Um, I learned uh, a lot uh, from each of them, kind of proportional to the time, but uh, I learned a lot. You know, Homer, uh, Homer was, I mean, what I always remember about Homer uh, was that um, uh, he was sort of uh, uh, a, the soul of whatever he took on. He had a tremendous sense of humor, very sly, very sly sense of humor, but it was wonderful. Uh, and Homer, more than anybody I worked with, just could kind of see, see a number of moves down the road. He, just, he could just look down the road and see the moves to make, right? And it was like a chess, uh, like a chess master. Uh, you know, uh, Lee, Lee was just such an intellectual. He and I, in some ways, had more of an intellectual rapport than I had with other, uh, with other people that I worked for. Lee could command a room like nobody uh, I ever worked with or ever saw, uh, for that matter. Uh, he could evoke people. Uh, uh, we used to be privileged enough to go to the honorary degree dinner. Before, the, the, the evening before, the honor, the, before commencement, there's a, uh, the president hosts a dinner for honorary degree recipients and others. We were privileged to go and uh, the way Lee handled those dinners, I mean, these people who were getting honorary degrees would just come out with this stuff, these stories. Uh, I remember the, the, the leader of the, uh, of the group, the gospel group, um, uh, Sweet Honey in the Rock, gets up there and just broke into song. I mean, she just broke into song. It was an incredible moment. And Lee could evoke those kinds of things. He could, he could bring out those kinds of things uh, uh, in people. Joe, as I mentioned, just such a uh, compassionate professional. Uh, he, he takes good care of his people. I don't know if uh, people know that after 9-11 and he had uh, stepped down, he was no longer interim president. He was uh, hired, I think it was the Jonathan Alger firm that had been in the World Trade Center uh, in, uh, in the attacks on 9-11 and had just been decimated as a company, lost so many people, and Joe was asked to come in and kind of help that company uh, rebuild, and there could not have been a better person uh, to do something like that. Uh, Mary Sue, uh, you know, there are so many things to say about Mary Sue. Uh, I mean, her, her gumption, you know, her steadfastness. Uh, but I really just think of Mary Sue as, as absolutely the consummate public servant. I mean, it is never about Mary Sue. It's always about the service. Uh, and I mean, just look, you know, I think she was ready to go on vacation and she gets a call and she comes back to be interim president of the, uh, of the university. And you know that there was never any chance that she would say no to something like that if she, unless she was you know, physically incapacitated or something, so. Well, turning away from the presidency towards another major group of, of people on campus is the students. And as we've discussed in previous Making Michigans, U of M really has this long, proud history of student activism. Mo you know, most famously, of course, are in the 1960s, but going back to the 1930s with, pro you know, engaged with the Spanish Civil War, protests over the benching of Willis Ward. Um, and when you were in the president's office, I know you were involved with working with a lot of student groups 
on a whole you know, range of issues, ranging from you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, to the two sit-ins by the students organizing for labor and economic equality in the Fleming Building. Um, can you just tell us a little about how you engaged with student groups and how they influenced the university's approach to you know, all these issues you've talked about tonight? Yeah. So if I could, I'd, I wanna, I'd like to kind of address the, uh, the safe uh, Palestinian thing first, just because it's connected to today. Uh, this happened, again, this was very shortly after Mary Sue had become president. Uh, and uh, SAFE, which is Students Allied for Freedom and uh, Equality, which was in, in many respects a pro-Palestinian uh, group, uh, had invited a speaker whose name I'm blanking on now, but a controversial speaker from uh, Florida International, I think, who had been on uh, kind of an FBI watch list for uh, being involved with terrorist uh, organizations. Nothing was ever demonstrated, uh, but uh, he was coming to speak, and there was a big uproar. Uh, and both sort of the Jewish uh, and Arab American uh, communities in the area were heavily involved. Uh, and, uh, you know, how did we handle that? Well, uh, this is not directly so much to do with students, except there were lots of meetings with students. Uh, there were thousands and thousands of emails and letters that came in. We, we literally answered, I mean, meaning in almost entirely I answered, <laughs> uh, each one of those thousands of emails or took all of those phone calls and we talked directly to people. And Mary Sue met and met and met uh, with all kinds of people and uh, listened and listened and listened, but never wavered on her articulation of the basic university values of free speech and uh, commitment to open discussion and, uh, and discourse. And a lot of other people were involved in and just managing the events. I think of Royster Harper, who was VP for Student Affairs, and um, uh, Bill Bess, who was the head of uh, public safety at the time. So that's, that's, one, that's one example. Uh, with Seoul, I should really defer to Larry Root, uh, who was uh, chair of the uh, chair of the uh, Committee on Labor Standards and Human uh, Human Rights, uh, uh, and a lot of the interface with that with that student with those student groups uh, were through were through uh, you know faculty uh, faculty or faculty student committees uh, like that committee. Uh, in terms of the sit-ins, you see very how very differently two presidents might be. The, the first sit-in. Uh, Lee was president. The students occupied the president's office for, I don't know, three or four days. Uh, this was at the same time, roughly, I think, maybe exactly the same time when the students were occupying the tower over uh, the Union Tower over Michigama. Uh, pretty intense uh, period. Uh, when Mary Sue was president, it was the second sit-in, and the students came and they occupied the, the, the waiting area of the president's office, and Mary Sue made it very clear that she would listen to students, she would talk to students, we would talk to students, uh, but that come five o'clock when the building closed, they were not going to be allowed to stay. And so students, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, they could come back at 8 a.m. the next morning when the building opened, but they were not going to be allowed to stay and students were in fact arrested, uh, which, you know, um, I thought was handled well, but was one of the harder things that I was actually involved in uh, uh, during my time. So I don't know if that answers the, the question or there's more? It, it definitely did. I mean, it de yeah, it definitely did because there, there is just such a variety of things and yeah. engagement. And I, I would just say, too, that I think, you know, students, student activism like this, uh, I mean, sometimes it gets what the students want. I think that some of the BAM protests are examples of that. Uh, a lot of the times, uh, students fall pretty far short. Uh, but that doesn't mean they don't have effect, an effect. I mean, I think that there was, you know, there were there are reconsiderations of policy and of procedures that take place that are not uninfluenced by the by what the students uh, by what the students have done. Now, over the last couple of years, you've taken a very different turn from the president's office. Uh, first, as head of the bicentennial for U of M, starting in twenty eight, and then you know, rebuilding this magnificent space we're in tonight, the Detroit Observatory. So I'm curious, how did you first become interested in the university's history? 
Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I've always been interested in history to some extent. But, you know, in, in some ways, it was, it, it, believe it or not, it was the Hollinger paper. I didn't plan this, but <laughs> it was Hollinger's paper because it was this kind of, uh, you know, it's this intellectual history that kind of tapped into my philosophical uh, interests and got me thinking about certain periods of U of M history. And uh, I just pursued it uh, on and on uh, in various ways. Uh, you know, it's important for an institution to have some grasp of its history, to think about its history, and to think about it, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a transparent and honest and, uh, and straightforward way, especially, especially a university uh, ought to do that. So, uh, you know, and then, and then, you know, I don't know, 2008, 2009, when, when did the Heritage Project start, Kim? Probably about 2011, 2012. Okay, okay. But you know, we, we saw the we saw the bicentennial kind of barreling down the road at us, and, uh, and that kind of increases your interest in history in a hurry. Right? So. Well, I think we'll open it up to questions from the audience, either you find people or anybody online. Uh, so a question from Dewey. Uh, you compared tenured faculty to contingent faculty, and you seemed to be saying the university should do more to provide academic freedom to contingent folks. Should tenured staff teach more? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question, and uh, I don't have a I don't have a I don't have a, a complete answer. Uh, on the one hand, uh, probably. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if that's a, uh, I, I think in some ways that's a ship that's sailed. There are so many pressures uh, on tenured faculty, other sorts of pressures, that uh, it's a difficult thing uh, to do. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, we're also talking about significant increases in the number of credit hours being offered. Uh, and so I don't think that there's a world in which universities can, at least in the foreseeable future, can... Uh, can get by without uh, large numbers of contingent uh, contingent faculty, uh, but yeah, I do think that they're. And again, these are not things that are not being paid attention to, but I think that uh, uh, they continue to be issues at some level, and uh, there need to be some. I mean, some protections. If any of you have questions, please just raise your hand, and we'll bring you a microphone. So. Hi, Gary. It's great to see you again. Yeah, you too, Larry. Could you comment on relationships with the, uh, with the state government and how that's kind of shifted over time? Yeah. Uh, so I wish I was more up to speed on this. Uh, but I do think that, well, okay, so look, you know, um, uh, how's the saying go that uh, uh, I, won't ref I won't say who the person is who, who used to say this, but uh, used to say that Michigan went from a state institution to a state-sponsored institution, to a state-funded institution, to a state-located institution. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I mean, I think that that does change the relationship to the state. If you look at the percentage of out-of-state students and how that has shifted, uh, we, are, uh, we are at our highest rate of out-of-state students, I think maybe since the 1800s, you know. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that, um, you know, that creates issues, right? Um, as, far as, the, as far as the relationship with the state government goes, I think that that has ebbed and flowed. And my sense right now is that it's in, in, in pretty good shape, or at least it, it, it was for a while. I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but, uh, but um, you know, there was a time when uh, the legislature in particular was out out after U of M in lots of ways. Uh, didn't like classes that were being taught here, didn't like things that were happening on campus. Uh, but that's also been true for a long time. I mean, that was true back in the 1960s when uh, the state legislature was castigating Fleming for being soft on the student, you know, the student protesters. So. Since joining the Bentley, what has been the biggest surprise for you? Uh, so first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, 
uh, Kim Clark and Bailey Oland, who were part of the fantastic bicentennial team, along with Michelle French, who's not uh, not here tonight. But this was a this was a this was a wonderful period in my career. This was a great team, and I think we uh, I think we accomplished a lot uh, during the bicentennial. Uh, the biggest the biggest surprise the biggest surprise. Um, hmm. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not coming up with any surprise. Oh, okay. I, I, there's a surprise oh. I've apparently expressed before. It's how different it was when you were in the president's office. Oh well, you that's were true. Never anyone to abuse power, but things got done. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it is, uh, that is true. That is true. Yeah, when. Uh, when you're in the president's office, whether you want people to or not, you tell them you're in the president's office, and things just happen. Um, uh, I mean, it used to it used to irritate me sometimes because it was harder to get a, it was harder to get a real take sometimes on things because they're telling you that you're, they're talking to you as a president's representative, not as somebody who wants to discourse. Uh, you know, the Bentley's a small unit. Uh, I was not used to small units, even the bicentennial, which was a small unit. But had the backing of uh, the backing of the central administration. Yeah, yeah. So, so that 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 you're right. That was a big surprise. Not not that I. I mean, not unexpected. I mean, Terry McDonald warned me that it was not going to be like things had been, but it was still kind of a kind of a shock. I know one undergraduate at Northwestern who was not impressed by how fast things were done at the president's office. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Hi, Gary. Two issues that you know mean a great deal to me and I know mean a great deal to you. Uh, what is your current sense of the relationship between the university and the general community? How well are we explaining ourselves and our purposes, do you think? The second issue is how one creates an intellectual community amongst the students. Individually, they are brilliant, brilliant people. But do we have really an intellectual community, and how can we address that? Yeah, those are, of course, Ralph, really, really important questions. I think that, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the first of all, you know, there, there are lots of things that show uh, how uh, the public esteem for higher education has, has, has dropped. This tends to be true more among Republicans than Democrats, but it's still the case. Uh, overall, um, uh, and in the state of Michigan, you know, U of M is seen in lots of parts of the state as an arrogant, uh, unaccessible uh, institution, despite a lot of efforts uh, to the contrary. Uh, I think the university tries really valiantly to explain itself to uh, the larger public. But I think a couple of things. One is I think the media environment, uh, the communications environment in which we operate now makes it difficult to get any messages through to almost anybody. Uh, and uh, the other thing I think is that, um, you know, people, people go by anecdote uh, more than they go by argument and, uh, and presentation. And I suspect I'd love to have Kim, you know, any thoughts you have about this. Uh, but, I mean, uh, maybe we could be doing more with anecdote. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really, really just, really just difficult. You know, with respect to, with respect to uh, uh, sort of intellectual community among students, those, you know, those, those commissions that I talked about on undergraduate education, that was often one of the issues, right? And, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's tough. I mean, you led, uh, you led, you co-led a great effort uh, with the Havruta courses that, uh, that you uh, developed, which really did, I mean, within the context of a class, but really did create a, a kind of community. I think that we've actually been pretty successful here uh, at the observatory with our uh, with our cohort of student docents in creating a kind of uh, engaged community. But I think, it takes, I think it takes commitment of individual faculty to try to make things work or of individual entities. Uh, I think that more could be done uh, by, uh, but maybe by different organizations to bring students in uh, to, their, to their academic operations and that maybe that would, uh, that would help. But I'd love to know if you have thoughts about 
Great number of thoughts, Gary. Yes, I'm sure you do, Ralph, I know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Yolanda asks, uh, what will you miss most when you leave the university? Yeah, uh, wow. Well, I'll miss, pe I'll miss the people. Uh, I'll miss seeing people on a, on a regular basis, you know. Um, I will especially miss interactions with students, I think, which none of that will necessarily entirely uh, end, but, um, uh, but it will certainly diminish significantly uh, from what it has been. Uh, so those, those are the biggest things, I think. Gary. What are your plans for retirement? <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm actually retiring, at least in part, uh, because, believe it or not, academic administration was not my first love. <laughs> uh, it really was philosophy and continues to be philosophy, and so I want to, uh, uh, I want to pick up on some, uh, some philosophy work that uh, has been uh, lingering uh, over the years. This, this, uh, this framework that I'm talking about, I'm almost ready to submit that as a paper. Uh, and there are some other philosophy projects that I have in mind, uh, some writing. Uh, next year uh, is, uh, is politics. I mean, it's such an important, such an important political year. I can't, I can't be retired and not be trying to do something uh, to bring about the right, uh, the right outcomes. Gary, I'd be remiss. My name is Ralph Neal. My experience of Gary will touch on your experience of Gary, and there are a few aspects of Gary that I want to mention. First of all, to mention that in my years at the University of Michigan, I've never met a man of more integrity. <laughs> you have been in many ways a moral compass of the university, and I appreciate that hugely. It's made my life here better. It's made the life of all of us better. The second character of yours, Gary, is insight. Mm. At meeting after meeting, when an issue would come up, you would sit there quietly for a while, start to look up over your glasses <laughs> after a little while, and then, after others had spoken, get right to the point of the issue on behalf of us all, and illuminate that and lead on to further discussion. Second, the next trait I'd like to mention is your perseverance. You play for the long game, Gary. <laughs> and I've known that since I first knew you here, and you've carried it through your career thus far. The last, for now, there are many more, <laughs> is the word temperate. But behind that, the Greek word sophosune, which is considered the highest principle, the highest characteristic of a human being. That is to be temperate to hold things in balance, to see things from more than one perspective, to hold yourself in balance in the midst of troubled times. I honor you for that, can't thank you enough for that, and look forward to seeing more of it as much as we can. Thank you, thank you, Ralph. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really honored. I'm, I'm really honored. Thank you. I think we can't top that, so I think we'll end there. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. Thank you to our online audience. Um, uh, is there a viewing tonight? Or? So, I think the sky's clear. Yeah, yeah so, so upstairs there will be observing. So, so I, we hope you can uh, join it, join up there. And, uh, and thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks again, especially I mean, to, to Andrew and to Austin for carrying this forward uh, next year. I hope you'll be able to come to some of the sessions. I know I will. I have one more question. Are you as excited about your retirement as I <laughs> Well, of course, I'm, I'm greatly relieved that you're excited about my, <laughs> my retirement. So. <laughs> but yes, I'm very excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.